Thank you. Hi. Um, I am going to speaking going to be speaking, excuse me, about grassroots art environments or visionary environments, um, which are collections of immobile constructions or decorative assemblages created by self-taught artists and or craftsmen made from a variety of surplus materials that are easily found or collected. Um, this is a photograph of the Totem Pole Park, um, an old um, postcard, in fact. These environments are found all over the world in a variety of shapes, sizes, and materials, often built to a monumental scale. The visionaries behind such environments are oftentimes solitary humans on the fringes of society creating transformative environmental works that speak to the reality of a society creating, <clears throat> or excuse me, of marginalized human experience. In the American context, the visionary voices behind such environments include mentally ill, um, immigrants, African Americans, the poor, women, homosexuals, elderly, born again Christians, and other marginalized populations. So here are some kind of um, examples. This is in Los Angeles, California, the Watts Towers. This is not far. It's located in Lucas, Kansas, um, the Garden of Eden, which utilizes concrete primarily. And Eddie Owens Martin's Pasaquin in Georgia. So although these works encompass a multitude of perspectives, we can still look at trends that exist within this genre to understand the importance of their function in our society and about a history that is oftentimes ignored. By taking measures to preserve these creations, we can fortify a history of multiple dimensions of the American experience. However, due to the unconventional attributes, atypical locations, and immobile nature of many of these grassroots art environments, preservation is challenging for a variety of reasons, including funding, public perception, and the understanding of the historical context of such sites. So this is another view of the Totem Pole Park. Um, and an older view. So this restoration project is currently underway at the Ed Galloway Totem Pole Park, um, just three miles east of Route 66 in Foyle, Oklahoma. Built between 1937 and 1948, it's the vision of its namesake and includes large and small concrete structures hand-built and carved with bas-relief embellishments, depicting animals, creatures, and Native American portraits. Site is the creation of a poor American man from rural Missouri and Oklahoma whose sculptural work monumentalized both the American Indian and the natural world. Born in 1880, he offers us an interesting point of view, one that saw the shift in social history from Indian territory to Oklahoma statehood and who clearly understood the importance of celebrating those cultures which were on this land first. This is a photograph of Ed Galloway in his studio, um, which we will also be visiting today. He was a craftsman and artist from a very young age, and after serving two years in the Philippine American Ward, was discharged in May 1904. He swiftly began to create larger carvings um, and sculptures. The influence of Eastern art from his time in the Philippines is apparent in his relief inlay woodwork ranges in sizes from very small items to very large figures, um, such as this beautiful piece, um, which is from about 1913. And he, at one point, was working in a, in a studio um, for an exhibition. And there was a, a fire that caught um, in a you know, neighboring studio. So this sculpture, he was, it was the only one that he was able to save, and he pushed it out of a window. It rolled down the street, and to this day, you can see little pot marks from the, from the road. Um, here's another sculpture. So his interest in woodworking developed into a long teaching career. For over 20 years, he taught manual arts and woodworking to orphan boys at the Sand Springs home just west of Tulsa. Although he made only a meager wage, he was devoted to helping those who had less means than himself. This perspective was not only his way of life, but would also become the mission of the Ed Galloway Totem Pole Park. After Galloway's retirement at the Sand Springs home in 1937, he, 
began to utilize concrete as a material for his art objects. This is another view of the Garden of Eden, which is found in, in Kansas. Um, concrete had become popular in the early 20th century and was both widely available and cheap due, the, due to the opening of many Portland cement factories across the United States. Canvas, Kansas became the fourth largest producer of Portland cement in North America. And throughout the Midwest, there was ample supply of the minerals necessary to make cement, limestone and shale. Natural gas fueled production, which Kansas and Oklahoma had a, an abundant supply of. And concrete was shipped from the plants via railway, often widely distributed. Its weatherproof properties enabled large scale construction in a short amount of time and with amazing durability. From the increased availability of this material came a rise in concrete art environments. Uh, these environments popped up across the Midwest following the popularization of concrete as a new material. Ed and his wife, Villy, bought land near Foyle, Oklahoma in the early 1920s. There, Ed built a very small house where he and Billy would live for the remainder of their lives. Shortly thereafter, he began constructing a turtle body from a large outcropping of sandstone near his new home. So this is an early photograph of the construction of the totem pole. Um, it is all concrete, but there was an original um, outcropping that this is built on top of. So on the back of this turtle island, he would spend the next 11 years building a 72 foot tall totem pole, all in bas relief, adorned with over 200 fastidiously hand carved animals, creatures, and portraits of American Indians. At the pinnacle of the totem stand four nine foot tall full figure Indian chiefs. Um, looking into the rising sun, this is a quote from um, an early article from Claremore. Looking into the rising sun is the peacemaker, Chief Joseph, a Nez Perce, ominously watching the setting sun is the stalwart Apache warrior, Geronimo. Gazing severely yet serenely to the northward is the champion of the historic battle of Little Bighorn, Sitting Bull, Chief of the Sioux and the grave, intelligent man with the winning personality, chief of the Comanches, Quanah Parker, the eagle, scans the horizon into the Lone Star State and all the Southland. So apparently, Ed had used a lot of National Geographics and other photographs to build these reliefed images into the side of his concrete. Um, the Totem Pole Park is a monument to the American Indian and the natural world. And although totems are pr traditionally produced by tribes along the northwest coast of the United States and Canada, Ed took care to include a variety of significant Native American figures and tribes represented figuratively, symbolically, and architecturally through the park. So here you see, you know, kind of the traditional totem from the northwest. And this is a representation found in the Ed Galloway Totem Pole Park of more of a traditional aesthetic. However, you see a lot of, um, a lot of different tribes represented. So this is a large arrowhead flanked on one side by Oklahoma's five civilized tribes, the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, and Seminole, and on the opposite, Western tribes. Important figures from four distinct Plains tribes look out from the top of the large totem, and representations of the Omaha, Kickapoo, and Mandan tribes have been identified as well. The Fiddle House is an 11-sided building inspired by the Navajo Hogan. This structure acted as, <clears throat> acted as a workshop, studio, and exhibition space, open to people visiting the totem pole park. Over 400 fiddles and other inlaid carvings were on display. Preceding Galloway's death, the park slowly fell into neglect and several hundred fiddles were stolen, never to be recuperated. Presently, 135 fiddles hang on display in the fiddle house for the flocks of tourists who visit every day. And as the iconic Route 66 became an attraction in the 50s, Galloway saw an opportunity to share his park with passersby and place signs along the highway directing them towards the totem pole park. 
A number of newspaper articles brought local visitors while Route 66 attracted people from all over the world. Galloway built picnic tables and a barbecue so that people would stay and utilize the park from the beginning of its existence. This park has been free and open to the public 365 days a year. After Galloway's death in 62, the park became overgrown with weeds and the sun bleached the paint on the surfaces. In the early 80s, the Kansas Grassroots Arts Association became interested in the totem and began the long process of restoration and preservation. The group, based in Lawrence, Kansas, poured through piles of old photographs to determine how the totem was once painted, as the paint at this point was weathered completely. They, they conversed with local residents about the brilliance of the colors and analyzed paint chips, worked with local paint companies that had been in operation during the 40s and 50s, and identified 18 colors which reflected popular hues of the era that matched two paint chips that they found on both the inside of the fiddle house and on the exterior structures. This is um, a photograph you can see, you know, complete um, decay on the interior of the totem. This totem is, you know, an exterior structure, but you can enter into it. And at one point, there were um, seven different levels that you could climb up into. Instead of using a lead-based paint, like that which Ed Galloway would have used, they switched the material to modern acrylic paint based on consultations with conservators at the time. The work that the KGAA did to recover the paint scheme is irreplaceable and is the only compiled record of what is considered the original color palette. So this is our color palette that we implemented um, based on the original colors that they had used. And these are some of the original diagrams that the KGAA had built to um, reconstruct the, the 18 colors. Um, these hand-drawn diagrams indicated the color codes of each of the figures in a paint-by-number graphic used for accuracy. This volunteer restoration project would take over 16 years to complete, which included research, fundraising, stabilization, and restoration. The Rogers County Historical Society would buy the property and eventually take ownership of the totem in 1992 in collaboration with the KGAA, Joy Galloway, and the Rogers County Historical Society. In 1999, after two previous rejections, the Ed Galloway Totem Pole Park joined the National Register of Historic Places. Virginia Krugloff repainted the lower third of the totem in 2009 but this still left over 50 feet, badly in need of a facelift. In 2014, a new conservation effort began, spearheaded by myself and Margo Hoover and overseen by directors of the Totem Pole Park, Patsy and David Anderson, and the Rogers County Historical Society. It's needless to say that the groundwork laid by the KGAA has been invaluable to our preservation efforts. Spaces has also been integral to our preservation plan. Spaces is a nonprofit public benefit organization created with an international focus on the study, documentation, and preservation of art environments and self-taught artistic activity. Spaces founder, Seymour Rosen, was instrumental in providing grassroots art environments, um, introducing, excuse me, grassroots art environments as a genre to the world. His life was dedicated to the documentation of art environments, and he visited the Totem Pole Park in 1981 to photograph the then weathered and decrepit structures. So this was the interior of the Fiddle House. You can see there are murals all lining the inside walls. This is the exterior of the, the um, Fiddle House. This is the top, the Indian, um, full figure Indian chiefs that you saw at, on an earlier slide. And our beloved giant face. <laughs> um, so Rosen's 22,000 photographs initiated the Spaces Archive, which is now recognized as the most extensive archive of art environments. Spaces Archive presently provides information on over 1,200 art environments located all over the world. We have been dedicated to grow the online archive of the Totem Pole Park at Spaces Archive by digitizing all photographs 
both archival and present, preservation diagrams, and other pertinent information. We believe that contributing this information to the public domain will ensure future grassroots conservation and provide greater protection for the totem pole park. Spaces provides extensive resources for preservation of concrete art structures, and we decided to switch the paint from latex to a silicate-based paint, also the, the chyme mineral coatings that Kelly had mentioned earlier. Um, so after consultation with spaces and chyme, this mineral-based paint um, petrifies into the concrete substrate through a natural chemical bond. The paint is environmentally safe, anti-static, keeping the surface clean. The color is unaffected by UV rays and will not fade in sun. Water vapor permeable, allowing the surface to breathe, which is important as a concrete um, material. Non-film forming, which means it won't peel. Water repellent, does not contain solvents and plasticizers, and is algae and fungi resistant. This paint lasts more than double the time that latex would in the same circumstances. The variety of colors available is limited due, due to the constraints of mineral hues, but we were still able to closely match the original latex colors with a thorough process. So this is before we started painting. So you can see the, the latex paint was already starting to, to peel. Um, we've currently completed two phases of the restoration, which includes the top two-thirds of the structure. The surface was cleaned down to the concrete substrate using a low-pressure power wash, working in small sections so that the concrete would not be left bare for extended periods of time. In areas where we found exposed metal, we cleaned and coated with a rust coating. In other areas where there was damaged concrete, we patched and repaired. So this is the face currently. And these are kind of a series of before and after photos. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> And I believe that's David Anderson, the director of the Totem Pool Park at the top there. <laughs> so this restoration project has been supported through small fundraisers, including local asks, the annual Totem Pool Barbecue, a Kickstarter campaign, and donations made to the gift shop. We're currently in the process of another round of fundraising for the next phases of the restoration project. And I'll be passing a hat around soon. <laughs> We're applying for grants that will supply more money to help complete the restoration of the large totem, remaining structures in the park, and the fiddle house. The next phase of the project is to remove the latex paint from the lower 25 feet of the totem, the large totem, and replace it with the silicate-based paint. It's important to complete this phase as soon as possible so that the age of the paint is consistent throughout the entire structure. Phase four will replace the paint on the other structures around the park. These include the um, arrowhead, which I'm painting here, the picnic tables. This is um, a large concrete tree. And there's a view from atop a lift looking down at the tree next to a mimosa. Some fences, some smaller totems, the facade of the fiddle house. Um, and during this phase, we're excited to engage with community members for hands-on support. I'm actually going to go back here. We hope to offer a class on grassroots art environments at a local university. Students will learn about visionary environments through a hands-on approach by participating in the restoration project. This class will build community involvement by engaging students to, the empower, to be empowered to protect regional treasures and take ownership of the future of the park. We believe that by involving people directly, we will be able to educate not only on the totem pole park, but about the relevance and importance of other grassroots art environments. We believe that by promoting a national context for these art environments, 
This will help in the evaluation and preservation of many other visionary art environments. The last phase of the project focuses on the interior of the fiddle house, wooden art objects, old photographs, remaining fiddles, and other displays from the Ed Galloway's life are currently exhibited here. We'd like to stabilize the archival prints, design a better display for the museum, create an educational component available for visitors and school groups, and digitize all information available on the park and the preservation process. As Galloway was committed to the education of children, we would like to promote this mission at the Totem Pole Park. We're working with educators to develop curriculum focused on cultural history and creative activities, as well as developing a walking tour for visitors. By focusing on education as a mission, we also believe that the Fiddle House could operate as a small library focused on visionary art environments, Oklahoma history, and Native American tribes. This small reading area would not only give context to the totem pole park, but also create a resource for those interested in the preservation of such sites. Included in this last phase is a digital open access web source to host all pertinent information on the totem pole park and the restoration process. We feel that making these resources available for future generations will further protect and promote the survival of these amazing visionary environments. We not only will work with Spaces Archives on this project to digitally display at Galloway's Totem Pole Park, but we'll also push other digital content that will exist in the public domain. We'd like to promote more pride and understanding about the importance of visionary art environments and to make the Totem Pole Park a site for education on not only Ed Galloway's life and art, but also on the genre and importance of these sites as American treasures and non-institutionalized art practices. With this project, we promote rural American perspective and vision, folk history, Native American cultural history, the importance of the natural world, and grassroots community initiatives. Throughout this project, we've been committed to furthering the mission of Ed Galloway, Seymour Rosen, and the Kansas Grassroots Art Association. Ed Galloway built this park to be free and open to the public 365 days a year so that anyone could enjoy his creations in nature. He was not only committed to the education of all children, especially those experienced, who experienced adversity in their lives, but also to the education and monumentalization of all Native American tribes. The KGAA was committed to fostering community support and understanding local under and ensuring local understanding on the importance of these sites. It is our goal to completely restore the totem pole park and structures, promote education by offering rich curriculum, and demonstrate commitment to the indigenous communities who persist in Oklahoma. Part of the realization of this goal is to establish relationships with more Native American artisans and to sell their handiwork in the fiddle house. The other aspect of this goal is to continue to educate visitors about not only the history of Native America, but also the vibrant present and future of these tribes and the role they have in Oklahoma and the nation at large. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Erin. Uh, remember, we're going here today on our field trip, which will be fabulous. Do we have questions? Anyone has the first question? Back in the back. Thanks. Hi, thank you for that. It was a nice comparison. Um, what repair materials did you use for, you said you did some patch repairs where there were losses? Yeah, so there were very minimal losses um, and cracks, and we, you know, by talking with Kime, they recommended different concrete um, mortar mixes to use in certain instances. So we worked with them really directly through very specific um, sites along the sculpture. Thanks. I have a question. How are the silicate paints holding up thus far? Um, well, that would be a question that David Anderson could uh, um, answer. I haven't been out there in two years. <laughs> so, okay. I'm, <laughs> David, I'm bringing you the microphone. Oh, 
Well, they're ex essentially just as uh, brilliant as they were a couple of years ago when you put them up. I've been looking to see if there's any uh, fading on the particular on the south side, and um, so far so good. Uh, they're looking looking really good. You'll be able to see that this afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, the reason I ask is because we get lots of questions about silicate paints, and we have not done research on them, so we're we're curious. Other questions? Here we go. Hi. Um, I was curious what led you to want to spearhead the restoration effort, <laughs> if you had maybe childhood memories of, of the park or... Um, yeah, no, actually, this is part of the reason why I became um, so kind of enthusiastic about this. I grew up in Oklahoma, I currently live in New York City and um, was back visiting a family friend who's another artist. And um, I was in his studio and have gone to his studio years and years and years and seen these photographs that I didn't really ever ask about that were um, old archival photographs of the totem pole. And so um, I think in 2013 or 2014, um, we were in a studio talking and he was like, you've never been here before? And I was shocked that I didn't know about this place because I think it's so amazing. Um, and so we, we took a trip out there and very kind of off the cuff, the woman at the gift shop was like, they've been trying to find somebody to paint this thing for years. <laughs> and I was like, I'll do it. <laughs> so from there, you know, we started the um, conversations with David and Patsy Anderson and the Historical Society and um, built a restoration plan and spoke with, you know, a number of different consultants on how best to go about this project. And so that's how it started. But, you know, that's also why I think it's important to have like a big educational component, because as an artist who grew up in Oklahoma and didn't hear about this, you know, I think that having access to the site um, for a broad spectrum of people is really important. Cool. Um, I had a quick follow-up question, too. So I've heard the term outsider artist and outsider art used a lot, and then I've also seen that that could be problematic. Is, uh, is visionary art a term that has maybe come to replace outsider art, or, or no. do you have any? Yeah, so there is a num there are, you know, like at least 10 different terms, and they're kind of interchangeable. Um, so art brute was the first term that was used, and um, this this came about in the 40s from another artist who kind of took inspiration from these people who were not trained in art traditionally, from an institutionalized kind of perspective. Um, outsider art is still very widely used, although I find it problematic because you know now the art world has grabbed onto the term outsider art, you can go to an art outsider art fair, which I think is, you know, kind of polar opposite. <laughs> um, so obviously the art world is constantly kind of cannibalizing things, and this is one of them. Um, so with these sites in particular, um, for a while folk art um, environments was used, visionary art environments, um, grassroots art environment is a term that I think kind of is the best to use for these sites because with folk art um, traditions, or with folk art tradition is very much a, a part of that, that word. You have um, a number of people who use a similar tradition to create a folk art. Um, Whereas these people are clearly like singular visionaries of a specific aesthetic that they choose to implement. So I prefer a grassroots art environment, but there is no term that's kind of better than another. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? One last question for me. Uh, how many visitors do you, do you average, monthly or yearly? Well, I'll let David answer, but I do know, you know, their their um, gift shop is open five hours a day, so that's how they're able to monitor the the number of visitors, um, which leaves out a, a number of others who have kind of gone to the park outside of those those hours. And as I have worked on the totem, you know, dozens and dozens come each day for sure. 
like Aaron said, our, we do keep track of, try to keep track of uh, people that come, but they're only, they only document, um, you know, our guest sheet in the afternoon. So I, I think we probably miss about half of them. We'll have 10,000 people uh, that'll come through that we can document or close to it, between 900, 10,000 people. It's interesting, one of the things that interested us when we first started doing this is the number of out of the country people. It is um, absolutely amazing. Uh, and we'll have over a thousand of those will be from other countries. It's always, uh, Great Britain is always leading. Usually it's uh, Germany the second, although they were beat out this year. My wife and I, a couple of years ago, were in downtown uh, Rome and uh, walking along in the evening and here Route 66 Cafe in downtown Rome. I actually <laughs> took a picture of it. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's, just, it's just amazing. Uh, in the fall, we will have tours, uh, a lot of times from different countries. There will be a, a whole tour bus comes through different countries. Very, uh, very popular outside the United States. And do you take donations at the at the park? We most certainly do. <laughs> they take donations at the park. Okay, we'll remember that. I just have a question about the cultural context of the of the site. Um, similar to you know Civil War monuments, um, sites like this are under some scrutiny for representation or misrepresentation of tribal culture. And so my, my question is, have you engaged with tribes um, to understand their perspective and incorporated that, or had a chance to incorporate that into your interpretation? Um, again, I'll direct this towards David, but um, the Cherokee tribe has given us um, significant donations for this project. Um, and, you know, in terms of the interior of the Fiddle House, there are um, some artisans that are being, you know, that the handicraft is being sold. Um, you, and this site itself kind of falls under, um, I think, kind of a tribute to and monumentalization of American Indian as um, an important presence in our country. Um, so outside of that, that's one of my personal goals is to really reach out and engage more of the native communities in Oklahoma and around to really um, provide their own information. And that's, that's where the component of the library, I think, is really important to, to provide um, context for what we're looking at and how we're looking at it. And this is a question that, you know, artists are constantly given. Um, you know, how do we look at something from a historical perspective in new eyes. And that's constantly something that we are trying to implement in our restoration goal. I'll address that, that, that is really an interesting question, particularly about the totem pole itself. Uh, we were giving you know, good, good donations by the, uh, by the Cherokee people. Uh, I happen to be part Cherokee myself. And, uh, most people, and when I talk about this, I, I represent it as a man who, although there's, it's controversial, he probably was no, 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 no part Native American, but he really uh, valued that. We have a quote from him that he says he wanted people to know there were people here before us, before the Europeans. So most people understand that and evaluate it. Uh, and evaluate. We have run on to th some a purist, for example, they'll say, well, now here, this is supposed to be a Cherokee and they have a, a headdress on. Cherokees didn't wear headdresses, and that's true. So we have had some criticism from uh, Native American leaders because it's not authentic. Uh, so both both happens. There's appreciation of it, and there's uh, some people would, would, uh, would criticize it. Well, and I will add, you know, there is... Um I think many, if not all, uh, portraits that were taken of Native Americans in the late 19th century and early 20th century were to, um, I mean, Edward Curtis was kind of the biggest, um, the, guy, the guy who did this the most, but would actually photograph the Native American in you know, their cultural context and bring props to add to the body in the studio to make it look more Indian. Um, removing any kind of Western influence from that. So 
this is a tradition that has been, um, unfortunately, has prevailed through most photographic representation of Native Americans. And um, it's something that we definitely need to address <laughs> always, I think, is you know how, how do we be as respectful as possible and the people who are being represented, how do they, where, what is their agency in that and how do they wanna be represented? I, one last question. Uh, we had a presentation yesterday morning from um, oh my God, Dylan Thuris from Atlas Obscura. Do you know if you're listed in Atlas Obscura? I do not know. It would be something to look into because I was wondering because of your foreign visitors. It's a very popular book and website for places like yours. I'll definitely look into that. Thank you. <laughs>